Wasn't that beautiful? <coughs> it's a song that uh, every time we consecrate our AFM missionaries, they're heading out overseas. We have our consecration service every August at the end of training, and that's the song we always sing. Here I am, Lord. And so uh, we'll give you all a warm welcome today. It seems that our Heavenly Father has answered our prayer and the rain has held off. Can you say amen? And uh, I was praying for rain this morning, but then I got outvoted in the prayer. So I was praying for rain to keep the air nice and cool, uh, but uh, God has given us cool air, uh, fresh air, and we thank the Lord that the rain is not coming down on our heads anymore. So uh, we serve a God who takes care of the small things of life as well as the big things. Uh, so I'd like to thank the Red River Outpost team for inviting me, Brother Nalon, you and your team. It's been a privilege to come and share with you. And uh, uh, we've been speaking on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night on some of the teachings of Jesus, uh, starting with the call of the disciples. Jesus has the authority to call you to be his disciple today. Uh, then we focused on the question of cleanliness, whereas the Pharisees focused on cleanliness of the hands. God is concerned with the cleanliness of your heart. And then last night we spoke on uh, the issue of marriage. Uh, because before uh, Satan, uh, before Jesus comes again, we know that the family and Sabbath are going to be under particular attack by Satan. We're seeing it today. And uh, a Christian, uh, when we get married, um, is to be a Christ- that marriage is to be a light on a hill that cannot be hidden. And so Satan is attacking our families. We spoke about that last night. And now I want to talk to this morning, uh, this is kind of a prophetic overview of where we are in the flow of history. Uh, for those of you familiar with, with Adventist prophetic interpretation and what we find in Daniel and Revelation, you will understand where I'm going with this. It isn't a standard approach to Adventist prophecy, but I hope you'll see uh, the, the flow of where I'm going with this. We're going to start out with the rise and fall of empires on a global level. Then we're going to narrow that down and see if those principles apply to the United States of America. And then we're going to look at where we are prophetically in time, known as the time of the end, what does it mean for us as, in, as a Christian body? And then we're going to come all the way down to us as individuals, okay? So we're going to kind of start with the, the, bri- the broadest view on a microscope. Then we're going to zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. And so I pray that God will bless our time together. Let's bow our heads and ask for the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Father, oh, Father who sustains us, oh, Son who inspires us, and the Spirit who leads us, be present in our midst today. Forgive us our sins individually and as a people. Wash away the sin and the shame of the past. And today, Father, we want to hear you speaking to our hearts. Father, we want to hear the momentous nature of the times in which we live. And Father, we want to know that our lambs, names in the Lamb's Book of Life. So Father, speak through me and for me. May your spirit move upon the heart of every man, woman, boy and girl present here this morning and those watching online. And Father, though we share these few hours together during this camp meeting, Lord, we yearn for that day when there will be no more departures and we will worship you on that sea of glass with the saints of eternity. So, Father, bless us now with your presence. Speak through me and for me is my prayer. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. So, it was on my 40th birthday 11 years ago. I woke up and um, I sat up and I swung to the side of my bed and I put my foot down and I stood up and I winced in incredible pain. It felt like I was standing on nails under my right heel. And I never had something like that before. And I put my foot down again a bit more gingerly. And my man, I can't put my foot down. What's gone wrong with my heel? I looked and there were no nails on the floor. There were no tacks. There was no um, darning needles or anything uh, from darning of clothes. And so I thought, what's going on with my heel? So I kind of hopped into the restroom by my uh, by our bedroom. And I sat down and I, I asked my wife, could you get my phone, please? So she brought me my phone. And I started Googling while I was uh, there in the restroom and said, um, stabbing pain in your right heel. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about. It's known as plantar fasciitis. It's excruciating. It's terrible. And I sat there and um, uh, the, the internet told me that men, this particularly affects men aged 40 and above. And it was my 40th birthday. I thought that's remarkable accuracy. So I started Googling what ailments do men aged 40 and above have, and it was such a depressing list, I, I went about some other business for the day. My time had come. 
Shortly thereafter, I visited my doctor for my uh, checkup, which we used to have every three or four years. And my doctor, she looked at me with certain sympathy in her eyes. She said, Mr. Vine, she said, you have now reached a certain age. And when you reach a certain age, you now need an annual medical checkup, not just whenever you feel like it. And as a man, when you reach a certain age, when you have your annual medical, certain medical invasive procedures will be performed. Now, would you like somebody else in the room with us or not? And I thought, what's going to happen to me? It was horrifying. You know, for the doctors in our room, I just want to confess, I have avoided any real medical knowledge in my entire life because medicine to me means cost and pain. So it came as a shock to me that I had to have these certain invasive procedures done from the age of 40, but my time had now, now come. Uh, last year, I turned 50, went for my annual medical, and my physician informed me that, well, Mr. Vine, you have now reached a certain age. The time has come for you to have a colonoscopy every five years. Now, would you like it this week or would you like it next week? And I thought I'd rather not have it at all. But she said, you do need to have a colonoscopy, sir. And so I had reached a certain age. So it was my pleasure later the next week to go in and to have them check me out on the inside. And apparently I'm all okay. I wasn't worried about it before and I'm not worried about it since. Last month, my doctor said, Mr. Vine, she said, you've now reached a certain age. And I'm thinking, I'm getting used to this phrase. Uh, and she said, um, you had chicken pox when you were young and uh, you're likely to get shingles. So I recommend that you have your shingles vaccine. And so I said, let me do some research on that because these days I want to check these things out. When did my research, and okay, I think I'll trust this one. So I went and uh, I sat down and the lady, the nurse was an Adventist and she says, oh, Brother Vine, she said, she said, um, I, I want to talk to you about one of your sermons. And I thought, well, this is going to be a painful injection. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, we, we, we had a, a short discussion about one of my sermons and uh, thankfully she was uh, in favor and I was really grateful for that. Uh, she didn't take too long to find a vein or whatever she was doing and I had my shingles vaccine and uh, I had reached a certain age. The time had come. Uh, two months ago, I realized I couldn't see anything out of my glasses very clearly at all. And uh, I, was, I was teaching my daughter how to drive, and I couldn't read the road signs up ahead. I thought, something's wrong with my eyes. So I went to check in with an eye doctor, and my last eye test was in about 2012, okay? And, and the eye doctor, she, she looked into my eyes, and she looked at me, she said, very gravely, she said, Mr. Vine, she says, you have now reached a certain stage of life. <clears throat> You have reached a certain age where your eyes are going to go from short-sighted to long-sighted. And previously, your prescription was minus three, and now it's minus a half. She says, that's a dramatic change in your, in your spectacles. She says, we need to take care of your spectacles. And she says, and because you've reached a certain age, you need to come in on an annual basis. We've reached a certain age. For those of you who are young, enjoy your youth. From about the age of 18, it's downhill all the way. So enjoy it while it lasts. <clears throat> Now, time is important. And as my wife said to me once, she said, we live life looking forwards, but we only understand life looking backwards. And in salvation history, we look forward to the coming of Jesus, but we understand where we are in the flow of history when we pause and we look back on what has happened before us. And it's important for us to pause and reflect on salvation history in order for us to realize the seriousness and the consequence of the time in which we are living right now. This is not just 2023. We're living in what the scripture calls the time of the end. And after the, end, the time of the end comes the end of time. So I want to reflect tonight or this morning on, on some of the flow, or the flow of history of some empires of history. Um, you'll recognize this is linked to Daniel chapter 2. We're going to go into Revelation 13. Um, and as we go through this study, I hope, you, hope God impresses upon you not just the seriousness of the times in which we live, but what God is asking of you in this time. So we're going to first of all start with the rise and fall of empires. So on the screen there, you see uh, 10 empires are listed. <clears throat> and I've given the dates. These are approximate dates. Some of them are very precise dates. So we'll start out with the Neo-Assyrian Empire. Now, the Assyrians actually had three phases to their empire. They lasted almost a thousand years in three different phases. But the most powerful phase of the Assyrian Empire was the Neo, that's the new Assyrian. It was actually the last phase. And that goes from 859 to 612 BC. 
uh, when Nebuchadnezzar and his father, Nabopolassar, they beat, uh, they beat the last Assyrian king, and then they defeated them at Carchemish. And after that, uh, Nebuchadnezzar came down to Dan uh, Jerusalem and took Daniel captive. The Assyrian Empire lasted about 247 years. Now, um, you have the Persian Empire. They went from 538 to 330 BC. We know that the fall of Babylon to Cyrus in Daniel chapter 5 through to 330 BC, the death of the last Persian emperor. They were replaced by Alexander the Great and the Greeks, or more technically the Macedonians, who were a small nation on the northwest coast, northwest part of modern day Greece. And uh, from 331 to 100 BC, you have the rise and fall of the Greek Empire. Now, the Greek Empire split into four components after the death of Alexander the Great. Many of us are familiar with that history. Um, but uh, Greek, uh, Greek philosophy lasted uh, much longer than the Greek Empire. In fact, we still live in a Greek philosophical world today. And our systems of logic and our systems of thinking, the fact that we reason from cause to effect rather than effect back to cause, is all because of Greek philosophy. So we still live with Greek philosophy today, just as we live with the remnants of the Babylonian Empire, because on your watch you have 60 seconds, and there are 60 seconds to a minute, and there are 360 degrees to a circle, and that is because Babylonian mathematics was based around the number six. They didn't have the zero back then. And so on your hand you have the remnant of Babylonian mathematics. Then after the Greek Empire, we have the Roman Empire, the Roman Republic. And I've split this into two. You have the Republic and then Imperial Rome. You have the Roman Republic from 260, where, where you have um, um, uh, Cannibal, uh, ha Cannibal, Hannibal, Hannibal, I should say. Uh, you know, Hannibal crossed the Alps with his elephants. He didn't conquer Rome. He was later defeated in, in North Africa by Scipio Africanus, the R R Roman general. And then up until 27 BC, where you have the end of the Roman um, Republic, and you have uh, the rise of uh, Octavian to the Roman throne, the imperial throne, otherwise known as Augustus Caesar. That empire lasted about 230 years. You then have imperial Rome from 27 BC when Augustus beat Mark Antony and Cleopatra in the Battle of Actium in the Eastern Mediterranean, all the way through to 180 AD to Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher emperor. And now the Roman emperor lasted, empire lasted another 200 years, but after Marcus Aurelius, it was an empire in steady decline, and there were repeated barbarian invasions, including Attila the Hun and the various um, uh, Visigoth and other nations coming out of Germany and Central Europe. The Imperial Roman Empire lasted about 207 years. You then have the Arab Empire, 634 to 880, that coincides with uh, the death of the Prophet of Islam, um, um, up almost until the founding of the, of the state of Baghdad, when, when the first Arab Jihad comes to an end. That lasts about 246 years. You then have the Mamluk Empire from 1250 to 1517, down there in Egypt, um, one of the Muslim dynasties, 267 years. You then have the Ottomans going from 1320 to 1570. Now, I know that the Ottomans lasted all the way through to 1915. I know that. But after 1570, and after Solomon the Magnificent was turned back at the gates of Vienna, from that moment on, the Ottoman Empire was on the slow decline. It had its day in the sun. You then have the Imperial Spanish Empire, mostly in Latin and Central America, 1500, uh, from Columbus onward to 1750. You then have the imperial, the Romanov Russian Empire, 1682, when you go on from Catherine the Great through to 1916 and the fall of the Romanov, uh, the Tsarist system to the Bolsheviks in 1917. They lasted 234 years. And then you have the British Empire from about 1700 through about 1950, the death of Winston Churchill, the end of the British Empire. And uh, Britain kind of like gave her last breath and world dominance passed to the United States of America with the Bretton Woods um, economic agreements. Now, as you look at this list of empires here, there are a th few things that strike you. One is that it doesn't really matter what technology those empires have. It doesn't matter what the mechanisms of travel are, whether it's by ox cart, whether it's by horseback, whether it's by chariot, whether it's by biremes or triremes, or whether it's by galleons or, or, or um, MiGs or, or F-16s. Um, and it doesn't matter the... Um, it doesn't matter the type of technology or how you travel. The bottom line is this. Most empires last about 10 generations. There is a natural lifespan for human empires. Empires do not last for thousands of years. Hitler tried to have the thousand-year Reich, and he lasted just a handful of years. There is something about the human nature that means that empires, they, they erupt out of nowhere. They have their day in the sun, and then they fade away. 
And as you look at the flow of history, you see time and again, this is what happens. Now, some of these empires changed. The Assyrian Empire was entirely land-based. Up there, based in northern Iraq, the city of Mosul today was ancient Nineveh, the capital of the, the of the Assyrian Empire. And so you start out with some empires are land-based, and over the years with advances in travel, so empires become more and more far-flung. So you end up with the British Empire, where you have a very small homeland, and you have colonies all around the world. And they said, at the height of the empire, the British Empire, the sun never sat, never, the sun would never sit or set on the British Empire because it went all around the world. So despite the changes in technology, despite the changes in travel and weaponry, um, these technological changes do not uh, impact the lifespan of an empire. It's about 10 generations. So let's ask ourselves, what are the distinct stages of an empire's rise and fall? And the first stage is this. It's the stage of the initial outburst. And time and again in human history, we find a small nation previously viewed as insignificant, often scorned by the more nation, powerful nations around. It will suddenly arise from its homeland and erupt and overrun large areas of the world. A great example is Alexander the Great, who led Macedonia, previously a minor kingdom northwest of Greece. He led them to conquer um, one of the greatest empires ever seen from Danube in Central Europe uh, and Hungary, all the way across to India and down into Egypt. That's a classic example of the eruption of a group of people into, into a global power. In 600 AD, 600 AD, there were two military superpowers dominated the Middle East. And they viewed each other with intense suspicion. And it was not the United States of America against the Arabs, you might say. It was the Eastern Roman Empire, known as the Byzantines, versus the Persians. And those two superpowers watched each other nervously, playing like this great game along the boundaries. Who's going to control the Middle East? But when the Arabs uh, at the time, 600, were a despised, disorganized group, they had no central government, no, no recognized leader, and no army. But after the death of the Prophet of Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam in 632 AD, the Arabs, or now the Muslim Arabs, erupted out of the Arabian Peninsula and they attacked both superpowers. They attacked the Persians and they went west and they attacked the Byzantines and they established an empire extending from the Atlantic Ocean all the way east to northern India and to the borders of modern day China. And we still recognize that Arab conquest in our language today. The Muslim general who marched, who, who sailed from North Africa, into Spain, uh, what we now call it Gibraltar, the Rock of Gibraltar. Gibraltar is a corruption of, of Jebel Tariq. Jebel means the mountain, Tariq is the name of the Muslim, Muslim general who led the armies of Islam across into Spain. So Jebel Tariq, now we call it Gibraltar, recognizes the Muslim armed conquest of North Africa and modern day Spain, leading to the, the Moorish Empire of Spain that let, let, existed for many years. In 1200, the Mongols in modern-day Mongolia were an insignificant group of tribes. But 20 years later, under the leadership of a ferocious general named Genghis Khan, they invaded China. And 20 years after that, by 1253 AD, the Mongols controlled the greatest empire of human history, stretching from the China Sea and Vladivostok, right there opposite Japan, all the way through to modern-day Turkey. Those empires erupted rapidly. These new empires are characterized in the initial phase by bravery, daring, and courage. The leaders display fearless initiative, crossing oceans, scaling mountains, carving through jungles, uninhibited by textbook or protocol or precedent. The new conquerors are usually tough, they're poor, they're enterprising, they're aggressive, and they tend to decay, decay, they tend to overthrow decaying, very defensive-minded nations. So after the age of outburst, you have what is known as the age of conquest. And the age of conquest, after the initial outburst, this expands the boundaries of the new empire, and it often solidifies those boundaries. This also is a time of initiative, of enterprise, of courage, of reckless um, physical um, abandon in battle. Territory is won by reckless bravery and daring initiative. One British admiral in the 1750s was executed at sea because he wasn't daring enough in battle. And after that, for the next hundred years, British naval officers were known for their reckless abandon because they will be executed. When the British were fighting Napoleon and the British wanted to uh, cross Europe in the Napoleonic Wars, uh, when the British wanted to take a French fort, the first men to go over the wall of the fort were known as the Forlorn Hope. And they were known as the Forlorn Hope because almost nobody survived the Forlorn Hope. But men queued up in multitudes to be in the Forlorn Hope. Because if you were from a poor background, your only chance of social advancement, social honor, and military wealth 
was to be in the forlorn hope and to survive it, because the survivors received great honor. So in the age of conquest, you have bravery and initiative. But as the new empire expands its borders, it reaches natural boundaries like the Atlantic Ocean or the, the, the China Sea. And so when, when empires reach their natural boundaries, they become, their militaries become more organized, more disciplined, and they're much more professional. And the new nation is very confident, it is optimistic, and it is often contemptuous, and it treats very poorly the conquered races that it has taken over. Which leads us to the age of commerce. Because once you've established your empire, that stimulates commerce and industry. When you can trade from one part of the world to the other with no boundaries in between, that stimulates trade in incredible ways. Uh, classic examples in history are the Silk Road, uh, which linked Beijing to Hungary under the era of the Mongols, or the wealth of Baghdad during the 9th and 10th centuries when it was the greatest city on earth. It was achieved through Baghdad controlling the camel caravans that crossed the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, and they controlled all trade between East and West. It was achieved in the 19th and the 18th century, when for 100 years the British Navy kept the world's oceans free of pirates, and there was an upsurge in global trade. The age of commerce quickly follows after the age of conquest. In the age of commerce, proud armies still guard your frontiers, but, there is, but the lust for military glory is replaced by love of financial gain. During stages one and two, the age of outburst and the age of conquest, young men are motivated by glory and honor and military conquest. But by, you get to, by the time you get to stage three, the age of commerce, these ideas become empty words because they add nothing to the balance sheets of the nouveau riche and the newly rich commercial class. So the age of commerce brings us to the age of affluence. As the wealth multiplies in any given empire, so does expenditure on luxury items on art, on architecture, on palaces and luxuries. Buildings are built in the capital cities. Magnificent boulevards are built. Parks are built that lend beauty to the cities. This is the age of Augustus of Rome, um, Queen Victoria of Britain, Solomon the Magnificent of the Ottoman Empire, and Woodrow Wilson of the United States. You go from the Pax Romana to the Pax Britannica to the Pax Americana. This is the age in which the magnificent public buildings are built. And for instance, if you look at Paris, have you ever wondered why Paris has such wonderful wide boulevards? There is a reason for it. It's not because they're romantics in Paris. You see the reasons, right? This happening this week, why Paris has wide boulevards. Because during the French Revolution, the king had his cavalry. And when the, when the poor rose up in Paris, how do they stop the king entering the city with his armies? That the streets were so narrow, you could barely get a cart down them. They just blocked off those narrow streets and the king couldn't get into the city because the streets were so narrow. So when they rebuilt Paris, um, when after Napoleon Bonaparte's era, they cleared out vast areas of the city. So they have these very wide boulevards that nobody can block the movements of the military to hold the people down. And if you see in Paris today, there's rioting in France for the last four days all across the country. And one of the struggles they have in Paris is when you have thousands of men fighting in the streets, you can't control the streets from the government's perspective because the streets are just so big. There's a reason why these things happen. The age of affluence, in this age, the wealth of the empire dazzles the onlookers. But all is not well because the wealthy are now too proud to fight. So time and again through human history, doesn't matter which empire you look at, immigrants are asked to fight the nation's battles. Immigrants start to populate the military. And warfare is waged, is waged primarily non, along economic rather than military lines. Beneath the surface, greed for money is replacing concepts such as public duty, service, honor, and civic responsibility. Personal wealth replaces duty, honor, and adventure as the objective of the young people. People seek their personal growth and glory rather than that of that of, that of their community, their people, or their nation. No longer do the schools produce men and women willing to serve their nation, but parents and students seek for the educational qualifications that produce the best salaries. Now, if any of this rings a bell with what's happening in America, just hold those thoughts. We're not talking about America just yet. If you read the, the Arab moralists of the 9th and 10th centuries, one Arab moralist, a guy called Ghazali, wrote, lived in 1058 to 1111 in Baghdad. 
He complained extensively that the Baghdad education system produced young men who were not interested in public, public service, but in personal wealth and aggrandizement. These complaints go back a long way. As a parallel to the age of affluence and subsequent to it, you have the age of intellect. <clears throat> This age is possible because there are ample funds available for the pursuit of knowledge. The merchant princes of the age of commerce and affluence build and bestow universities. The young seek academic honor rather than military glory or public service. Time and again, empires experience the age of intellect just before they enter the age of decline. And so during the age of intellect, you see an, an, a flourishing of universities. Almost every town, every community wants to have a university. If you look back at Oxford and Cambridge in Britain, many of those colleges going all the way back to the 1300s were created by wealthy uh, nobles who wanted to be remembered for centuries. And they have been remembered for centuries, but those nobles have all come and gone. The Greek Empire, the Arab Empire, the Persian Empire, and the Roman Empires all achieved their full intellectual flowering after the military collapse of those empires. It's an interesting phenomenon. The, the Romans complained that we conquered Greece militarily in about 180, 150 BC, but then Greece conquered Rome philosophically. And so Rome was dominant militarily and in the militarium with its engineering prowess, but Greek philosophy in turn conquered Rome. So who was the real victor in the clash between Rome and the clash with Greek, between Rome and Greece? While Rome conquered Greece militarily, Greece conquered Rome philosophically. And with the age of intellect comes endless public debate, which polarizes the nation involved and the empire. The idea that intellect alone can save the situation without practical skills, without unselfishness, without sacrifice and devotion to civic duty leads to inevitable social decline. Whether it be the British Parliament of the 1950s and 1970s, the end of the British Empire, or the Byzantines in Constantinople who fought vicious civil wars within the walls of Constantinople while the Muslim armies were sitting on the outside for almost 50 years, just waiting for the Christians to fight themselves, kill, themselves, kill themselves off due to their internal civil wars, um, empires in decline exhibit political polarization and extreme social division. Which leads us to the age of decline. There are multiple characteristics in all of these empires that, that, that are common across all these empires. Firstly, in, in the era of decline, there is very rapid immigration. People sense that an empire is in decline and they're going to get the last fruits while they can get it. The original ethnic group becomes a minority within their own major cities. And while the nation is still wealthy in paper and there is the appearance of social cohesion on the surface, whenever there are social, economic, or political difficulties, different communities band together to protect their own interests rather than the interests of wider society. Classic examples in our own history are the LA riots. And what happened in the LA riots in Chinatown, the, the Koreans and the, and the Chinese shop owners? They banded together to shoot anybody that enters their district because they're going to protect their small community within the larger city. We saw it in, the, in, the, uh, the, in 2020, communities banding together to protect our interests rather than thinking about the wider interests of society. So when empires start to go into decline, as long as there is money, everybody's happy to live side by side. But the moment the money flow starts to falter and economic difficulties or political difficulties set in, people revert almost to a basic tribalism. And it happens time and again throughout the era of, of empires. In the age of decline, there is a rise in defensiveness. Because she is wealthy beyond measure, the nation is no longer interested in glory or duty or growth, but her primary concern is how to retain her wealth and her luxury. And I can say this, I meet a lot of people in my role with Adventist Frontier Missions. I meet people who are relatively poor in terms of finances. And I meet people who are relatively wealthy. And I can say this, the poor are often consumed by worry about how I'm going to pay the rent this month. And the wealthy are often consumed by worry about am I going to lose my wealth in a stock market crash. Having wealth does not necessarily bring peace of mind. And there are some people who sit with the stock market or the Dow Jones on a ticker tape on a TV screen in their office. And their emotional state during the day goes up and down, depending on where the stock market is, quite literally. So these eight empires have a rise of defensiveness. Defensive military postures are adopted. This is the time when the Great Wall of China was built. 1939 was the time when the Maginot Line was built in France to protect against invasion by Germany. When the Roman Empire was at its maximum height size and the uh, Hadrian, 117 AD, he built what is known as Hadrian's Wall. 
a line across Scotland and said, we're going to go this far and no further. And from that moment on, the Romans were on the defensive. They weren't conquering any further. When the empire is in decline, you can tell it's in decline because it's having a very defensive mindset. At this stage, the elites are concerned and consumed by a desire to protect their wealth rather than to use it to further any civic good or public cause. You also find in empires in, de in decline that a deep pessimism sets in. The energy, the youth, the belief, the courage of the founders is long gone. As the civil institutions fail one by one, cynicism and universal pessimism set in, which only hasten the internal social, political and economic decline. Frivolity and sensual indulgence, which are byproducts of despair, are the frequent companions of pessimism. Let us eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Now in Rome, the, empire, the emperors used to keep the people happy. Um, if you want to remain the Roman emperor, you gave them two things, panamet circusum, which means bread and circuses. You had to give the poor their daily allowance of bread, and you had to have gladiatorial contests in the amphitheater, because as long as people had food in their stomach and they had mindless entertainment, they didn't rebel against the Roman authorities. These days in the West Bank, if there is a killing or a shooting, and the young uh, Muslim men of the West Bank want to protest about it, how do the Israelis respond? They'll often pump porn through public TV in the West Bank, because that keeps all the men at home rather than out on the streets protesting injustice. So decline is a moral and a spiritual disease. Um, across the Byzantine crowds, as they were going into decline, about to be conquered by the Muslims, the, the, the Byzantine population was divided into um, people support of the chariot racers, and there were four teams, the reds, the blues, the greens, and, and the whites. And, and you were a red or a blue or a green or a white, and people fought pitched battles in the street like soccer hooligans today supporting their team. In modern sports across the United States and Europe, um, as in the ancient declining empires, the heroes are no longer the statesmen, the generals, or the literary geniuses of society, but the heroes of society are the athletes, the singer, or the actor. And public morality collapses during the age of decline. In the late 9th century, Baghdad was the greatest city on earth. But as the Arab empire fell apart, so did public morality. Contemporary historians in the 9th and 10th centuries complained of popular singers singing erotic songs accompanied to the lute uh, akin to a guitar. In the early 10th century in Baghdad, historians record obscene language, sexual promiscuity, indifference to religion among the youth, political corruption and polarization. They actually introduced the first five-day working week in history in the Arab Empire as it was falling apart, and there was a general reluctance to work was noted by the contemporary Arab historians as their empire was falling apart. Let me read that list again. Erotic songs, promiscuity, indifference to religion, political corruption and polarization, a welfare state, a general reluctance to work. Those are the symptoms of nations in steep decline. Decadence is a moral and a spiritual disease. It results when those, ha those who never earned it enjoy the fruits of excess wealth and power for too long. It produces cynicism, pessimism, and frivolity. And the, na the citizens of nations and empires in decline no longer make an effort to save themselves or their nation because they've had so much sweetness for so long, they're no longer convinced that anything's worth fighting for. Yet while organized religion fades in these empires in, in decline, and self-indulgence, vice, and frivolity seem to hold sway, there is often the rise of spiritual leaders who raise the banner of Christian duty and service against the flood of depravity and despair. Classic examples in history are Amos, who was called by God to minister to Israel, a nation at its greatest military time during Jeroboam II, the time of Jonah. Augustine of Carthage, uh, North Africa, one of the greatest thinkers in, in Western history, who, was, who lived during the collapse of the Roman Empire. He was from North Africa, modern-day Tunisia, and he ended up living in Rome. Patrick of Ireland, and you don't say this too loudly, but he was an Englishman. He wasn't an Irishman. I have an English and an Irish passport, so I can say that being accused of being prejudiced, all right? But Patrick of Ireland was taken as a slave to Ireland, and he escaped slavery, went back to England, and then decided to go back to Ireland as a free man to share the gospel. It's an incredible story. John Wesley, who God raised in the 1700s in Britain, a nation that had the beginnings of an empire, but um, public morality was at an all-time low. Uh, alcohol abuse, uh, sexual immorality was rampant, and God raised the Methodist movement to bring Britain back from the br br brink through the ministry of John Wesley. And of course, in Russia, you have Alexander Solzhenitsyn. 
And if you've never read his writings, I would recommend you start reading his writings. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, if you don't know where to start, um, uh, I would read um, First Circle, then I'd read Cancer Ward, then I would read A Day in the Life of Van Denisovich, and then I'd read Gulag Archipelago, if you can stomach it. Um, but he wrote about what it means to retain your humanity in a system that is fundamentally inhumane, that denies your humanity. How do you maintain your humanity? As we look over the, the, the lifespan of these empires, we notice a few things. Firstly, that the lifespan of an empire is approximately 10 generations. We see that repeatedly. We also see that empires, they, they don't tend to die due to military attack. They die primarily due to internal decay, division, and moral corruption. Because too much wealth for too long gives you spiritual diabetes as a nation. And then the nation dies. So I've we've talked first about the rise and fall of empires, the life cycle of empires. Empires go through stages. And you know, I speak to you, know, I, I, I have an American passport. I'm an American citizen. I say I'm British by birth, I'm American by choice, and I'm saved by grace, all right? And I grew up in Britain in the 1970s when the empire was in steep decline, when there, we had a four-day working week, when we had power rationing, when half the nation was on strike at any one time. Nations in decline go into fierce internal struggle, bitter internal struggle. And people polarize into their tribal groups when nations go into struggle, struggle, into turmoil, into decline. And it almost takes two to three generations for a whole new generation to rise who didn't know the wealth of the empire, and they can start learning to work for themselves once again. So I've lived through the decline of an empire. I've seen it at first hand. I've seen the social division. When my father was a pastor in England, uh, Margaret Thatcher, maybe you, may, many of you have heard her name, she took a political decision to close all the mines of England. All the mines just going to be closed. Why? Because the mines had gone on strike in the 70s and brought down a government. And she said the miners cannot overturn a democratically elected government. So she took the decision to close every working mine in the country, despite the fact that most of our electricity came from coal, and they were very pro profitable. And what she did was she imported coal from the Soviet Union, from Poland, stockpiled two or three years worth of coal, and then shut down the mines. She said, I'm going to beat the miners. And if you live in West Virginia, you know what it means when the mine closes in your town. Everything shuts down around that mine. The whole economic life of that town depends on the mine. And we were ministering in Yorkshire at the time, and we saw the division and the poverty and the anger of men on the streets when the government just closes down your business because somebody else did something 10 years ago and you just see homes and families being torn apart when, when this kind of, um, these political decisions are made. Empires in decline are not pretty. So let's look at the stages of the American empire, shall we? And I'm not saying this, I'm not saying this because I'm happy about it. I'm saying this because there is a coming kingdom that will wipe all earthly kingdoms away. And when Daniel is called to explain the vision of Daniel chapter 2 to King Nebuchadnezzar, the very first words out of Daniel's mouth are before he talks about the head of gold, he says, in your dream, O king, you saw a statue, and the statue was terrifying. So what Daniel is saying there, the summary of earthly history is that the rise and flow of empires is a terrifying experience for people throughout the ages because human rights are routinely trampled upon within empires. Conquest involves trampling upon a few other people's human rights. And so Daniel says the flow of empires is a terrifying thing. And we are living in one empire right now. Um, and uh, there, is, there is a coming kingdom that is built on justice and righteousness and mercy and truth. And we are ultimately citizens of that kingdom as followers of Jesus Christ. So we're just passing through. Whether you lived in the Judean Empire, the Empire of King Solomon, whether you lived in the British, the Persian, the Arab, um, whether you lived in the empires of Africa, Africa has had many empires. You look at modern day Mali. In the middle of Mali, you've got Timbuktu. Timbuktu is a remote, remote place. It was a center of world learning for some centuries. And there's still a library and music festivals in Timbuktu because the Malian Empire spanned much of West Africa and it was much of it by conquest. And uh, they, we have many empires in, in, in Africa we simply don't study. Part of the reason is we tend to study um, interesting bits of history like the Roman Empire or World War II, and there are less fashionable parts of world history that nobody really cares about. But it's still history nonetheless, 
and we can still learn lessons from the empires of Africa, the empires of India, the, the Aztecs and the Incas of Latin America, and the Mongol and, and, and the, the Ming dynasties of China. But we're now in the stages of the American empire, so let's look at the stages of the American empire. And um, so I'm, I'm just dividing things up here. And so the age of pioneers, you might say, was 1492 to 1754. It was an era of Spanish and English settlements driven by religious, commercial, and imperial interests. It's the time of Christopher Columbus, the settling of the first those 13 colonies on the east coast of the Atlantic there. That was then replaced by the age of conquest. The USA gradually emerges as a world power, expanding to the west with the doctrine of manifest destiny. There is a massive importation of slaves from across the African continent to support the economic model of the southern economy and plantations. In America in those times, particularly the 1840s, there was a great awakening. There were reform movements. There was the annexation of Texas. They may dispute that. And there was the Mexican War. And America in the 1840s, at the time when Ellen White was a young lady and the time of the great Advent movements and the Millerites, it was awash with reform movements. There were people advocating for health, health reform, dress reform, education reform, the suffragette movement, and abolitionists. America was, was abuzz with reform movements during the age of conquest. America was not just pushing back the geographical boundaries, but people in America were trying to push back the social boundaries as well in a positive sense. And we as Adventists came out of that, 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 um, that bubbling pot of reform movements in the 1840s and the Second Great Awakening. Then you have the age of commerce, 1844 to 1945. Uh, can you still hear me back there? No? No. All right. Can we turn the volume up, brothers? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so can you hear me now back there? Yes? If you can hear me, raise your hands. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm partly deaf in my left ear. Whenever my wife talks to me and I don't want to hear it, I turn my left ear to her. Then I can claim I never heard you, and I sleep on my right side at night, so when she talks to me at night, all I hear is wah, 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 and I can legitimately say I didn't hear you, and she can legitimately say, but I told you, and then we're both right. So I'm glad we have no hearing problems today. We then come on from the age of conquest to the age of uh, commerce. 1844 to 1945, climaxing in World War II, and America being the military and industrial arsenal of freedom around the world. You have the era of international isolationism, the Indian wars leading to the conquest of the West and to reservations, the rise of social Darwinism and um, um, scientific racism in America, the era of mass immigration as a backwash to minorities and to immigrants such as the KKK. It's the growth of industry and commerce like never seen before and so it's the American factories give victory in World War II. That's the age of commerce. That leads to the age of affluence. 1945 to about the year 2000. That's the age of affluence in America. There is, a, there is the military industrial complex, the civil rights movement. The growth of the suburbs is driven by the era of the automobile. There is a dependence on fossil fuels leading to endless wars in the Middle East and the establishment of the petrodollar dollar under Kissinger, and there is serious industrial pollution across our nation. That then turns to the age of intellect, when there's a massive increase in young people going to colleges across our nation. And all of a sudden across America, every community wants its own community college. And you find the rise of online education. And so one college, University of Arizona, University of Rasmussen, Cosson, Rasmussen College in Minnesota, starts to expand nationally all across the country in the age of intellect. This is the era of significant immigration from Latin America. It's the rise of the environmental movement. It's the rise of economic globalization. This is significant for us because in the age of commerce, people still think I'm an American corporation. But in the age of intellect, those corporations no longer care about their American workers. They're concerned about the bottom line. So Ford may have started in the United States, but it is now a global corporation, and it doesn't care where its workers live at all. And so we have the rise of American corporations into international corporations, into global corporations, 
and communities are devastated by the movements of capital. We see the rise of ethnic and ideological diversity within the United States, leading to internal culture wars, the collapse of the, United, of the USSR, the, the uh, Union of Socialist Soviet Republics, leads to the US having political and military hegemony worldwide. Yet internally in America, during the era of 1960 to 2000, we have shifted to a philosophy of despair. In the 1960s, in France, you had the existential philosophers, and they said, um, democracy gave us Adolf Hitler, science gave us the atom bomb, and communism gave us the gulag and, and the horrors of Stalin. And so the French philosophers um, ends up with what we now call a philosophy of despair. That there is nothing good about the human condition. And that, that philosophy turns into what we now call postmodernism. And out of postmodernism, which says that, that all truth is relative and everybody has their own standpoint and you have your perspective and I have my perspective and there is no absolute truth and everything is blurred, out of postmodernism comes critical theory. And out of critical theory, we get LGBTQ studies and fat studies and post-colonial studies and trans, uh, gender studies and critical race theory. And all of these philosophies that we now see on the streets of America, when you trace them philosophically back through the ages, they all go back to the philosophy of despair of France in the 1960s. So when we see on the streets of America young people with their hair dyed electric blue and all the rest of it, they're not our enemies. We can agree with them on the fundamental diagnosis of the human condition is that the human condition is fundamentally flawed. I may not agree with your critical gender theory. I may not agree with your critical theory. I may not agree with your postmodern theory. I may not agree further back with your existential theory. But what we can all agree on, which is a starting point for your philosophical journey, is the fact that humanity, left to its own devices, is doomed. And so we can talk about, this is what we share in common with our social justice warriors on the streets, the pride parades. We say, we agree with you that without something special, humanity is flawed and it is doomed. And because we live in a society that is driven by a philosophy of despair, we're desperately trying to create meaning for ourselves. So on sports TV, they talk about who are the top 10 quarterbacks of all time? Who are the top five basketball players of all time? What are the top 100 movies of all time? We're creating significance in a world that philosophically denies the possibility of significance and purpose. But we cannot live as humans without the possibility of forgiveness of, of significance or purpose or meaning. Therefore, we're trying to create purpose and meaning. And the sexual revolution in America today is driven by this desire for meaning and purpose. Because in the, in the biblical worldview, God gives us the gift of conjugal love within marriage that is not an end in and of itself, but it leads to two things. It leads to children and all the joy that, and love that that brings and the propagation of the species, but it also leads to a cementing of the love relationship within that marriage. So within the Christian worldview, that the sexual activity is not an end in and of itself, but it is a means to a greater goal given us by God. In the French um, existential perspective, which drives the sexual revolution, because nothing has purpose, that means there's nothing beyond the sexual act. Therefore, your identity is driven by the sexual act. That's the limit, the height, the extent of your identity. So that is why your sexual orientation, your gender identity is such a big issue for so many people today because that is their only source of meaning and purpose, philosophically. And we're not to be angry with such people. People who are marching on the streets in the pride parades, they may be chanting their slogans and all the rest of it. They are products of a, philosoph of a philosophy of despair, and most of them have no idea this is what's driving it. And the Christian solution is to say, yes, all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God, but for those who believe, there is the promise of eternal life. And so if we go back to the starting point for all these movements, there is a Christian answer. And rather than debating what you're doing out here, let's go back to the root causes of this and say the gospel is the answer to the underlying problem that you're trying to address. So we are right now in the age of intellect, as I'm sharing. We have this 
um, we have this philosophy of despair driving our nation and on the streets of our land. And uh, then that leads to the age of decadence. Well, I would say that in America, we're now in the age of decadence. We have massive illegal immigration. We have the, ex the expansion of the welfare state. Britain expanded her welfare state in 1950, just as her empire was fading. The Arabs in, uh, expanded the five-day working week and their welfare state, just as their empire was collapsing. And uh, so welfare states are put in places by government, not so much to help the people, but to essentially control the people because you become dependent upon us. And it stops the social division taking over. People get trapped in the dependency trap. All right, we have the situation in Britain, I don't know whether you have it in America, where if I'm unemployed and I've got four children, I get put in public housing and I get so many benefits that unless I get a job that's paid like twice as much as a regular teacher is being paid, it's not worth my while to work. I'm caught in the benefits trap, therefore I'm, a, I'm the servant of the state. I'm trapped. I'm a, this a client electorate. I will never vote this government out. They're basically paying me to exist. And so empires in, in, in decline, in the era of decline or the age of decadence, they put in place welfare states, not so much to help the population in need, but to kind of keep them under control. We have the rise of military defensiveness in America today. We have the rise of national pessimism and cynicism. Is that right? Rather than celebrating the literary giants of our past, we have a pop culture that is meaningless froth. We are watching before our eyes, as in previous empires in their era of decline, a collapse in public morality. We have soji confusion, sexual orientation, gender identity confusion is affecting our children. We see the loss of tolerance. Tolerance is a Protestant virtue. It is not a secular virtue. The concept of tolerance in America comes from the writings of Roger Williams. And Roger Williams comes across uh, 1630s to, to uh, Boston. He, he, he refuses a job as a pastor in one of the big churches there in Plymouth Rock and then in Boston itself. And he goes just north of Boston and he realizes and he writes about this. And he says that God speaks to the conscience of the Turk, by which he meant the Muslim, the Jew, the Protestant, the Catholic and the Native American. And if God speaks to the conscience of all peoples, therefore we must respect the conscience of other people and the decisions they make in good conscience. And that is why, uh, from Roger Williams, we have the concept of tolerance. Now, in American history, there was a famous sermon by John Winthrop, one of the leaders of the Pilgrim Fathers, and uh, his sermon was quoted by John F. Kennedy that this nation will be a, a city on a hill, yes? It gives light to the world. Remember that, the city on a hill speech by John F. Kennedy? Well, uh, when Winthrop gave that sermon, what he was saying was his vision for America with the Pilgrim Fathers was not of religious freedom. It was of, of a union of church and state between Puritans and the magistrates. And they were looking for a, a, a union of church and state when the Puritans first came over. And the city on a hill speech that gives light to the world, they're essentially envisaging America as a formal union of church and state. And that vision did not prevail when we wrote the, the First Amendment to the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment to the the first amendment of the Bill of Rights, in the Bill of Rights, the US Constitution, it guarantees us free religion, religious freedom and freedom from religion. And uh, that's, the, that's the legacy of Roger Williams. So in America today, we have the loss of tolerance because we have competing worldviews. And those worldviews will take no prisoners and they will, now, they, will now, they will allow for no coexistence of different perspectives. And just this week in the Supreme Court, there was a major landmark decision about um, a graphic website design in Colorado. And you should read about these things because while we yet have the freedom to share the gospel and to speak truth, we need to make use of that time. Now that time will not last forever. Michigan this last week passed a law in the house that basically says if you, you, if you cause offense to anybody in any way possible along the lines of sexual orientation, gender identity or pronouns, it's a felony with up to five years in prison and $10,000 fine. And this can be done whether you say it in person, whether it's online. I'm thinking, man, I'm going to get prosecuted as soon as that bill gets passed. And it's a direct challenge to the Supreme Court and the First Amendment to the U.S. Bill of Rights. So what we're seeing today in, in this era of, of decadence, we're saying the loss of tolerance. We're seeing in our nation the erosion of formal religion. We're witnessing social polarization. We're witnessing hatred of our past, which is now condemned as being systemic oppression. We're watching the rise of dysfunctional and divisive politics. We are seeing the intentional debasement of our currency, 
which essentially trans well, transfers wealth from the poor to the wealthy in society. That's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing the erosion of our middle class, which means the erosion of functional democracy. And we are seeing a massive increase in income inequality in our nation. And the net result of this is we have surging deaths of despair. And in Kentucky and West Virginia, you know all about deaths of despair. If you drive through one of those hollows in West Virginia, you'll see meth house after meth house boarded up. Those houses cannot be lived in any longer because of the chemicals that we use. We see the social destruction in front of our eyes. And so whereas it used to be that the primary source of, 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 of uh, suicide in America was middle-aged white men who achieved all they wanted to in life, and they're 55, 60 to get a cancer diagnosis, and rather than face 20 years of long, painful decline, they just took their life. Now one of the largest growing sources of uh, suicide in our nation are teenagers because they've imbibed this philosophy of despair in our schools. And what is the point of living? What is the point of living? And it's interesting to note, and I'm just going to just take a brief detour into politics here, that America, I believe, is in that age of decline or age of decadence right now. And historically, no empire has ever recaptured its previous glories. No empire has ever moved back in time. No empire has ever succeeded in going from the age of decline back to the age of affluence or to the age of commerce. There are some in our nation today. Our nation is at a crossroads. There are some in our nation who would say we want to take things back to how they were. The problem is a nation is at the age of affluence or commerce, not because of changes in the laws, but because of the way people's hearts are. And if people are no longer interested in doing that, which is good for the community and advancing the community as a whole, you're not going to get back to where we were in the past. I think you know what I'm talking about here. You can't turn back the clock unless you turn back the people. And to turn back the people requires a spiritual revival where we love our neighbor as ourselves and we don't repeat the injustices of the past. And we say that civic duty and public service and honesty and integrity are values that we hold high in our nation because those are no longer held high in our nation, certainly if you look at Washington. So it's very hard to see how you can go back because no empire in, in history has turned the clock back on time. So where does America go? Where do we go? Well, we're at this crossroads. Some want to take us back, but the book of Revelation says we're going to go in a certain direction. And it's not a very pleasant direction. So I want to talk just briefly about the end time role of America as, as we find this in Revelation 13. I'm just going to add some flesh to the flesh to the, the picture here that we were founded on the twin principles of being Republic and being Protestant. But we know that there is coming a time when all the founding principles of our Republic will be repudiated. And that includes the Bill of Rights, including First and Second Amendment, Third and Fourth Amendment. We will reach a state where the deep state will replace democracy. And if you don't believe me, that's exactly what is happening now. We are going to reach the point where the globalist narrative will replace truth in the public square. We've just lived through three years of systemic lies at a global level. We are going to reach the point where coercion will replace liberty of conscience. We're going to replace, reach the state where totalitarianism will replace religious tolerance. We have reached the place where the creature rather than the creator is worshipped. We see that during Pride Month in our streets. We will reach the points where as God is rejected by our political and social elites, so our nation will end up speaking like a dragon as per Revelation 13. Now the dragon in Revelation 13 is Satan. That means that Washington will be dominated by a satanic force and satanic agendas. And satanic forces will dominate our political system. And we will become that end time totalitarian deep state and authoritarian system that will trample on liberty of conscience and uphold a satanic agenda. This is where we are going as a nation. This is what we find in the book of Revelation chapter 13. We will be crippled by politically correct, critical theory inspired health, self hate. The USA will cede its power to a globalist agenda and we will use our military and economic might to enforce global economic mandates and ultimately persecution and the death penalty to uphold false worship as dictated by the papacy, the first piece of Revelation 13. And those faithful to God will face persecution up to and including death. Now, I'm grateful that we're Adventists, which means we see beyond this end time crisis and we know that Jesus is coming again. When you know the end of the story, it's easier to get through the story. 
All right, if I ever read a whodunit, like an Agatha Christie or a Sherlock Holmes, I'll read the last page, then I can feel comfortable, like, how does this thing end? Okay, does anybody else do that? Okay, but as Adventists, we know the end of the story, which is that every tear will be wiped away, and death and disease and sorrow will be no more, and the sea will give up her dead, and God will dwell with his people, and his people will dwell with him, and there will be no more death anymore, and Satan and his demons will be destroyed in that lake of fire. And I would say, burn, baby, burn. Because there are too many people are dying with cancer and diabetes and drug abuse and depression and divorce and all the rest of it. Satan has to pay the price for what he's done. And so we're now living in this era, the era of decline. We've gone through the American empire. We've gone through the lifespan of our empire. And now we're in the era of decline. And empires in decline tend to lash out. Because they want to keep their power and they want to keep their wealth. And Revelation 13 tells us quite clearly this is what's going to happen. And I've just filled out some of the details for you here on the screen. Which means we are now living in what the Bible calls the time of the end. In prophetic terms, we have reached a certain age as a planet. In prophetic terms, a certain time has now come. We are now living in what the Bible calls the time of the end. We find the phrase the time of the end in Daniel 11 verse 40. Uh, which is the end of the 1260 years of papal supremacy in Europe and persecution of the saints. And that came to an end in 1798 AD, when the Pope was taken prisoner by the armies of revolutionary France. And so the, the time of the end has come. But for what, you may ask? Well, until Jesus stands up to deliver his people, as in Daniel 12, 1, 2, at his second coming. And so between the time of the end beginning, in 1798, and Jesus coming again, we're going to live through the final chapters of the great controversy. That's where we are now, folks. We're in for a bumpy ride. When the pilot says, to buckle up because we're going through some turbulence, we better buckle up. Now, we know that there is going to be a good landing. We know that Jesus is coming again, but we've got to get through this turbulence before Jesus comes again. And we get through that turbulence together. Because in the last three years, I hope you realize that when push comes to shove, there's no cavalry coming to the rescue. And our entire church hierarchy couldn't care less about your well-being. I'm sorry to say that. You were thrown to the bus. We were thrown to the bus. And people lost their jobs. They lost their homes. They lost their businesses. They were thrown out of university. They lost custody battles. They were denied unemployment benefits because of the statements of our ecclesiastical elites. And it was wrong. It was wrong. And in, that, in these last three years, we've learned real quick that you need to be able to trust a few people. If somebody came to you and said, brother, do you have any ivermectin? <laughs> Knowing that you're not supposed to give out ivermectin if you're not a dice doctor with pre prescribing rights, what are you going to do? Do you trust that person? Ask the underground Adventists of the Soviet Union, how did you get by? It's because I trust you with my life. And if I'm tortured, I'm never going to really reveal your identity. So as God has given us this pause, we've had a dry run for the final crisis. The final crisis is coming. Now God is giving us in his mercy a time when we can reflect what pressure points did the world have on us during the last three years. And I need to get rid of those pressure points in order that when the next crisis arrives, I'm best placed to survive the pressure. It means getting out of debt. Maybe getting out of that mortgage. Maybe no longer seeking a career in corporate America that imposes mandates. And maybe earning a trade where everybody needs you and they'll pay you anyway to do a, pray, a skilled job. It means positioning your life so the government has as little influence over you as possible and you're as independent as possible. We've been given this opportunity to ask ourselves, what gods in my life made me override my conscience in the last three years? And to deal with those gods and to get rid of those gods so that in the future crisis, when more mandates come our way, we can smile at the storm. In the time of the end, this is the time when the social polarization between evil and good will grow into a vast chasm. Compelled by the love of Christ, the earth will be lit by a man will be lit by manifestation of God's character among the saints. Right, that's the fourth angel, Revelation 18. Whereas the lost of this world, driven by hatred of the sin-bearing and soon-coming Savior, they will visit their anger upon the saints of God. That time has now come. The time has come when evil will flourish and achieve a full flowering among the unregenerate. When they chant in New York City, we're here, we're queer, we're coming for your children, the mask has come off. The gloves have come off. We're coming for your children. When certain states in America are now sanctuary states for trans surgery, 
where if your child runs to certain states like California, they will protect them and they will fund the new, the, 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 um, the, 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 uh, I'm looking for the word now, not the, not the emasculation of children, the mutilation of your children against your will as a parent. That time has now come. The mask has come off. Satan's doing his best to destroy the next generation in any which way possible. Evil is going to flourish and achieve a full flowering among the unregenerates, as there will be a harvest of righteousness among the saints of God. There will be a reaping of wickedness among the wicked and a harvest of righteousness and moral living among God's saints. That time has now come. All around us, we're witnessing social and civilizational collapse accompanied by moral confusion and the existential pain and despair and search for meaning and identity caused by our society's underlying philosophy of despair. That time has now come. The people on the streets are acting out of an underlying philosophy of despair, and it's no surprise that they're doing what they're doing, because they don't know any other way to find purpose and meaning in life. With the collapse of our fiat currencies and the rollout in the next couple of years of central bank digital currencies, the rollout of the new WHO global health verification scene, which means you cannot travel unless you're upstate with certain injections, the infrastructure for Revelation 13 and the global implementation of buy, no buy economic mandates is being put in place in front of our very eyes. And if you don't believe me, then you can make your 10 or 20 year investments, but your dollar's losing value every day. It can buy less and less every day. And soon every transaction you make will be known and then it will be controlled. And if you don't believe me on that, in Europe, the, Euro the uh, European Central Bank, their proposals for the Euro digital, digital Euro, which is about to come out, is that you can have only, let's say, 3,000 euros a month in your account. But if, if, you, can't, if you need 4,000 euros a month to live, that means you can never build up savings. That means you're essentially a slave to the system. They have the right to charge you negative interest rates that if you don't spend all your money within a certain time, will take money from your account. The, the, the euro, the digital euro, they're talking about it being, um, uh, fungible, that it has an economic, um, lifespan. So if you earn money in January, you must spend it by the end of March. So your ability to build wealth and to be independent of the economic system, government control is being eliminated through the introduction of central bank digital currencies. That era is taking place right before our eyes. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. If you just read the financial news, everybody's talking about this. So while you have your dollar, use it for God's kingdom. Use it for God's kingdom. Because when I buy my United Airlines tickets, it says, this flight generates 36 tons of carbon dioxide. Now, if they're measuring it today, that's a precursor to them monitoring it and then controlling it. You can't control that which you do not measure. And so the fact that they're measuring the carbon dioxide per flight is in only a matter of time before you get certain carbon credits you can make so much travel per year, and after that, you are done. So we see the tentacles of control building around us. The, the infrastructure of Revelation 13, 16 through 17, those end-time mandates, is taking shape before our eyes. This is a serious time in which we're living, brothers and sisters. This time that prophecy has spoken about has now come. We are now living in the time of the end. We're living in the time that the prophets wrote about, that the disciples asked Jesus about on the Mount of Olives, Matthew 24 and 25. At this, the time has now come where in this age of Christ-hating intolerance, the gloom of global persecution is only going to get darker and darker. And because the persecution is going to get worse and worse, the time has come for the saints of God to shine ever brighter. And our witness, your witness, my witness will be recorded in the annals of eternity. Your life, your witness, your ministry is lived out before unfallen worlds, before unfallen angels and before fallen angels. Today, as five or six precious souls give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, there is rejoicing across the cosmos. And there is anger among the, the armies of Satan that people say that God is a God of love and he is worth following. And so your life, your ministry is not just lived out in Michigan or Kentucky or Texas. It is played out on a global cosmic canvas. Every word you make and every breath you take ripples throughout the universe. And it says one thing or another about the character of our Heavenly Father. The time has come for you and I to wash off and turn away from the meaningless, God-rejecting froth of modern popular culture. The time has come for you and I to ask for the grace to overcome and be free of our besetting and our cherished sins. The time has come for you and I to ask the Holy Spirit to so recalibrate our moral compasses and to so sensitize our consciences once again that we will be as true to duty as the needle is to the pole. The time has come for you and I to pray for the grace, 
the truth and the strength to unapologetically, unreservedly and unashamedly stand for the right though the heavens fall. While the world may have sold itself to do evil, as did Ahab, we will not sell our spiritual birthright, as did um, Naboth. And we will not be bought or sold by threats to our careers, to our professional licenses, to our jobs, to our finances, our families, our social reputation, or our well-being. We will not be bought or sold, because we are sold out to truth, and we will stand for truth. It is time to sacrificially love and minister to our neighbors as never before. It is time for you and I to put down deeper roots than ever in Scripture for to turn off the cable or better still snip the cable and to learn what the word of God actually says. The time has come for you and I to ask for the anointing, for the infilling, for the sanctifying, for the convicting and the converting power of the Holy Spirit in each of our lives. The time has come for you and I to dwell upon and to put into practice the teachings of Jesus on a daily basis as never before. The time has come for you and I to use our last remaining economic freedoms and our evaporating financial resources to advance the gospel in our nation and around the world and to grow God's kingdom in our communities here in Kentucky, in the United States, and to the ends of the earth. That time has now come. That time has now come. We are approaching the time of the end. Uh, we are in the time that we're approaching the end of time, and the time that the prophets wrote about has now come. The time that the prophets longed to, to see has now come. The time that the disciples longed to be a part of has now come, and we are living in that time. The time has come for you and I to bear God's last message of mercy to our dying world before the end of time, because the end of time is coming soon. That is the time when heaven girds her strength and the new world and all her majesty and her might, her glory and her grace will step forward for the liberation of our dying world. That time is almost upon us. So our work in Outpost Centers International and at Red River, this ministry here, and all of the ministries that are involved with here today, our work is a work of profound importance. And we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter what this world may say, because the Apostle Paul said it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So the time has come for you and I to choose courage over fear, faith over doubt, and boldness over timidity. We move forward with a promise, and this was quoted this morning by, uh, by Brother Chris up here, that there is no limit to the usefulness of one who, putting self aside, makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his or her heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. That time has now come. You might say that we were born in this time. That is true. Beyond that, you might say we were born into this time. That is true. But we were also born for this time. We weren't just born in this time or into this time. We were born for this time. God in his providence could have made you, could, you could, could have been born in the Mayan Empire or the Mongol Empire or the Zulu Empire or the Malian Empire or the Arab Empire or the Roman Empire or the Russian Empire. No, God in his wisdom said in that final crisis, I'm going to have a people who will stand tall for me. And in his providence, you, we, are those who he has chosen for this time in Earth's history. So therefore, our, not just our primary loyalty, our only loyalty is to the kingdom of God, from where we're expecting a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to live by the principles of that kingdom and not by the values of all the fallen kingdoms of our world around us. This is the time in which we live. And you may say today, oh, Pastor Vine, I'm not sure I'm up for this. Well, over the last three years, I've come to love not just the prophet Daniel, but the prophet Jeremiah. Because if you want to know about cancel culture, look at the prophet Jeremiah. And when God called Jeremiah as a young man, he said this, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nation. Which means that Jeremiah was God's handiwork and God does not make mistakes. He handcrafted that young man for the ministry in his time. And we have been born into this time, for this time. We are knit together in our mother's womb by the Holy Spirit that we might be a light on a hill that cannot be hidden no matter the darkness that gathers around us. We are born for this time. This is your time. This is our time. There will be short-term pain, but I have not seen, nor hath ear heard, nor hath entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who survived this time, pardon the paraphrase. God has prepared something wonderful for those who will stand tall in this time. 
You were born in this time. You were born into this time. You were born for this time. You were knit together in your mother's womb. You were consecrated. You were set apart. You were gifted. You were anointed and you were appointed to be God's witnesses in this time. It's a humbling thought, isn't it? So we don't just come to camp meeting. Praise the Lord, we have the freedom to have camp meetings. But we come to camp meetings so that we can get a renewed vision of what, of what God wants to do through each one of us. Whether you want to come and serve at Red River, serve at an OCI outpost, serve with Adventist Frontier Missions, serve with Brother Canaan and his wife down there in Tennessee, wherever God calls you to serve, don't harden your hearts today. Serve where he's leading you. O oh, Goth, walk through the doors of opportunity open before you. It may not be rational, may not be logical, may not make any sense, but nothing that kingdom work ever does. The only thing that matters is I'm trusting the Lord to lead me through this door. So if you find a ministry opportunity during this camp meeting and go looking for it, ask, connect with people, not just you want to chit chat, but you're asking God to lead you to a ministry opportunity. Spend the next 24 hours asking the Holy Spirit, Lord, for the rest of this camp meeting, lead me to a ministry opportunity where I can use the gifts that you've given me. We were born for this time. The salvation of billions of people depends upon God's people unashamedly standing tall for Jesus Christ. And in case you're wondering about whether this will be successful or not, on that sea of glass, we read there'll be people from every nation, tribe, language, and people. Which means if you work among the Native Americans and Navajos, or the Lakota of North Montana, if you work among the Hispanic immigrant communities of Lexington, if you work among the Haitian communities of Chicago, if you work among whatever community you work among, there will be people from those communities on the sea of glass. So the promise is given, there will be an eternal reward, an eternal harvest for your ministry. Our role is to be faithful and shining for Jesus today. Come what may, with no way the world is going to get hold of us. And we leave the results in God's hands. Today we have five baptisms, is it, Brother Nalan? Two baptisms. Okay, two baptisms. You know, a baptism is a serious moment. It's the new birth experience. We're watching a miracle today take place. But you may be sitting here today and you realize that you were baptized many years ago and your life has drifted into sin or you've drifted away from God and you want to recommit yourself today to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and to shine for him. And if you're in that position, I want to encourage you. We have a pastor here. Just raise your hand, pastor. And we have Brother Narlon and his team here. And before we go down to the baptism, have a word with them. Have a prayer with them. Say, I want to recommit my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, let me give you a, I'll finish with a short story. Do I have time, Brother Marlon? I know time is moving on here. Uh, <laughs> the shrug of a, of a wearied, resigned man. Oh, brother, brother, brother. <clears throat> It took Moses 40 years to get to the promised land, okay? <laughs> the first recorded martyrdom in Christian history was a guy called Polycarp. He's 86 years old. He's the Bishop of Smyrna, just north of modern-day Izmir on the west coast of Turkey. Uh, the Roman soldiers come, they arrest him, they put him before the Roman governor. And the Roman governor says, I, if you want to sacrifice to the statue and say, Kaiser Kurios, which means Caesar is Lord, then we'll let you go. And uh, the Christians would refuse because Jesus Kyrios, Jesus is Lord. They wouldn't say Kaiser Kyrios. They say Jesus Kyrios. And so uh, the Roman governor said, well, I'm going to execute you. And uh, we're going to throw you to the lions. And, and this bureaucrat said, excuse me, you can't throw people's lions after 3 p.m. Quite literally, he has to be executed or beheaded um, or burnt at the stake. So that's what was going to happen to him. And Polycarp, he stands there. And this is the first recorded Christian martyrdom outside the Bible. And he stands for the Roman governor. And you can download this on Google. It's called the Master of Polycarp, P-O-L-Y-C-A-R-P. And he says, four score and six years I have served my king and he has done me no wrong. Why should I now deny my king? And we have may, some of us may have served the Lord for four score and six years or may feel like that. But when times of persecution comes, we're not going to deny our king. Because nobody remembers the names of the governor or the soldiers, but we know the name of that faithful witness to Jesus Christ. And I want my name to ring for eternity, don't you? So may my prayer and your prayer be that four score and six years we will serve our king. He will do us no wrong. And there is no way that we're going to deny him or lose our faith in him. May that be our experience. May that be our joy. May that be our privilege. 
And uh, may, that, may the world see in us a manifestation of what God can do in the life of a sinner whose life has been changed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. I invite you to bow your heads with me. We'll close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we are living in the time. Not just any time, not just some time, but we're living in this time. The time of the end, and Father, the end of time is almost upon us. And Father, in your mercy and in your grace and in your wisdom, you have seen fit that we should be born into this time for this time. So today, Father, may your spirit descend upon each one of us in a powerful way. Wash away the works of the flesh and give us a beautiful harvest of the fruit of the spirit, of love and joy and peace and gentleness and generosity and self-control and kindness. Father, the gifts that you have given us, the talents to preach, to teach, to pray, the gift of hospitality, whatever those gifts may be, may they receive a full flowering in our lives from this day forward. Give us opportunities to shine for you in this coming year. And Father, I pray that no matter what this world may do to us, as the gloom of persecution gathers and a social hatred gathers against those who are faithful worshippers of the Lamb, I pray that each one of us will be found faithful and true, that despite the attacks of Satan, your angels will watch over us, that words will be given us from on high when we are called to account for our faith, and that you can look down from heaven and not say, is that my boy? But you can look down from heaven and say, that's my boy. Father, may we bring joy and honor to you through our lives as we wait the coming of Jesus. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.